welcome to the Embed Live, the actual live uh, webinar. This is the second webinar that we've done. So welcome and thank you for joining us. The topic that we're going to be covering today is the low touch economy and going contactless. Now, I think that many of us have, um, as we've navigated the pandemic and a time of uncertainty, we have seen different uh, businesses pivot and different consumer trends taking off. And what we're going to be covering today is what are those consumer trends that have driven and become a forcing function to certain technology that is a technology that is has permanently changed the way consumers now behave. Um, um, such that we can actually call it an economic force and hence the term welcome to the low touch economy welcome to the contact free economy and we'll explore that today just the insights and then what it means from a technology perspective what actually is the low touch economy and then we're also going to be speaking to someone who is going to share um, his own experiences um, an actual FEC operator so with about 21 people joining us now, we're gonna get started. So once again, hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Paz, and I want to welcome all of you who are with us now. And also just touch on, if you will, um, I know that every all the markets and all the countries at this moment are in various places in terms of reopening. Um, and, when, and some of them are looking and some of them are looking and facing um, a, a lockdown. Um, I want to send a big shout out to everybody who's navigated this in the past months. You know, tough situations don't last, but tough people do. And I especially want to send the shout out to many of our friends who are in Melbourne and are facing, what is it, Andy, about 300 days now in lockdown? In the Almost Street 300 days, yeah. Yep. yep. So once again, hang in there. Okay, so if we take a look at who's with us today, we have Jeremy Dickamore. How are you, Jerry? Jeremy? I'm good. How are you, Sarah? Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today from the West Absolutely. Coast of the United States. Um, Senior Strategic Partner, Manager from Global Payments Integrated. Welcome. I'm really excited to walk through some of the insights that you're going to be sharing with us. We also have Embed's very own Nerd in Chief, our CTO, Andy Welsh. Hey, Andy, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Sarah? Cool. Thank you very much. And we have Doug Roth, an FEC um, owner. He was the founder with his wife of Scary Strokes, and he's going to be talking to us today about his experience, you know, through the pandemic, some of the tactics that he um, employed to get him through the pandemic so that he had a successful reopening, and then just some of the different measures that he took to mitigate risk so that he would be able to protect his community, his employees, his customers, and offer good, clean fun. So that's basically what we're covering today. Um, now, most of you, all of you actually are muted with the exception of the panelist. Any and all questions, please go ahead and submit them via the chat um, icon that you'll see here on Zoom and um, we will get to those at the end. Also, there's gonna be a recording of this and you'll see it on social media later. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing and Jeremy is going to take it away. I appreciate you having me on. It's great to have a, an opportunity to talk about this. Um, I wanted to really focus more on trends that we've seen in the US. We tend to be a little slower in adopting things. I wouldn't be surprised if the rotary phone got back in style in the US at some point. We tend to like our technologies and kind of keep a hold of them. So I'm going to compare just two years here and it mostly just to show the stark contrast in what has happened just in those two short years. Because as we look at it, contactless isn't new here. Contactless has been really well adopted across the globe in Australia, in Asia, the UK. We have folks that are using contactless payment functionality on a daily basis. Here, it's really been slow to adopt. So I'm just gonna share a couple metrics here. Um, first, we've had contactless around for more than 23 years, but really when it started, it was a great idea to drive consumers to your individual business. So we started with mobile speed pass come by, get gas really easily, and it drove consumers to them because it, it made it painless. And so it's really how folks tended to adopt it here. It really wasn't until 2011, 2014 that we saw Google, Samsung Pay, and Apple Pay come into the market. And even as of 2018, 
globally, we only had about 230 million active users of those wallet systems. So it wasn't as broadly reaching as we would think it might be. In the US, it was even more so because we weren't adopting it as merchants. So in 2018, only about 20% of merchants were actually enabled to accept a contactless payment. So even if you had your phone ready or you had a card that was capable of that, your merchant wasn't able to accept that payment. And so that really affected just the state of contactless payments. In 2018, we were only sitting at about 0.18, that decimal point really is real, 0.18% of transactions that are in the US were actually done with some sort of contactless payment method. It's kind of sad when you look at the amount of transactions and the fact that most people do have the ability to make that happen now. So in 2018, the card brands knew that was going to be something. So they were sending cards out, whether that's new cards going out or existing cards that consumers already had were being swapped out for cards that were contactless enabled so that they could start using them. But a lot of them, again, tend to sit in wallets. And so by the end of 2018, while it's not a small number, we really only saw about $26 billion in transactions that were contactless. So really just a so-so growth. And what we were looking at was a steady growth, but it was a very steady, mostly flat line that we didn't see a lot of. Now, I tend to think of myself as an optimist, but really when we came out of 2018, we had research showing that by 2000, sorry, by 2020, about 30% of transactions that were in store would be made by someone using a contactless enabled card or using a digital wallet. In 2018, I definitely would have said that that was very optimistic. In 2019, I would have said the same thing. I have contactless cards. But so many places that I went to didn't have the ability to accept it. So it just wasn't on my mind. Even if it said tap, I still insert it. A lot of what was driving that too is we were slow to adopt EMV. So even when you were checking out, the, the teller helping you would very often say, go ahead and insert your card now. And so we were being kind of trained to insert our card, not to tap it. Even now in the contactless economy, we still have people that are saying that when their device will say that. So 30% for me in the current frame would have been really optimistic. So we want to look at 2020 now, and we're 25 years in, and among our more popular digital wallets, Google Pay and Apple Pay, we're a little over 550 million global active users. But the U.S. has kind of realized that they were behind the curve now. So we've really moved up. People were realizing, I need to get new hardware. I need to actually be able to accept the consumer's payment, which is probably what we really want to be able to do is make sure we get that money. And we don't want to be drawing customers in, but not then offering them the ability to pay the way they want to pay, the way they feel safe paying. So consumers have moved up. Merchants have moved up. And now we're seeing more that merchants are sitting around 67% with hardware that is capable of accepting either a digital wallet pay or they can use their contactless enabled card. Transactions on the consumer side have really moved up. We look at just the 40%, but really when you take into account that we were at 0.18%, that is over 220 times what we were at in 2018 really big jump. So we can see that people are really grabbing onto that. Uh, Visa was planning on sending out about 300 million contactless enabled cards this year, but because of what's happened, they've actually moved that up and are now estimating that they'll send out well over 410 million contactless enabled cards. So, um, I'm, I'm just basically saying, wow, um, these metrics are unbelievable. Going from 26 billion in 2018 to 178 billion in 2020 is unbelievable. And the trend that what they um, forecasted was 30% of transactions when in fact you've landed at 40%. So Absolutely. that is dramatic. Very dramatic. And that's why in just over two years, when we look at that again, the US is really slow on that technology. 
we talk about the iPhone 12. I'm sure you guys are on iPhone 20 outside of the US and we just aren't aware of that. We just aren't adopting things here. I like to tease that we are just, we're really low on the curve there. But when we look at that drastic difference, we see $178 billion. That's just the US. Right now, they're estimating that we'll finish this year with around $2 trillion in contactless transactions globally. That is a huge amount of money. So when we start looking at just that number, when we consider how it's going to grow, right now they are estimating that by 2024, that number will hit $6 trillion globally. Wow. Definitely not a number that we want to shake our heads at. That's right. So as we look at you know, anything that we, that we do, I'm sure that Doug has his scorecard for the company. So I want to put up a bit of a scorecard for contactless. And when we look at it, you, know, you introduce something and you push for adoption, you get momentum. And then there's something there that is built in to keep people coming back. Right. But really the introduction of contactless in the U.S. just didn't build anything. As of 2020, we had yet to make any significant progress in contactless. And yet now, all it took was COVID kicking in. And now, according to Forbes, contactless payments are up by 150% just since March. Wow. That is a huge number. Absolutely. So looking back at it, what really caused it was not having the wallet right there, having our phone. I mean, our phone is our life. Everyone has it on them. But it was COVID-19 that became that major catalyst to make people more aware of their contactless enabled cards and digital wallets. It's always been available. They just weren't grabbing for them. Right. So the thing that I find really interesting is that we were reaching a point where studies were showing that convenience was really the major factor for folks in payments. They just wanted it to be easy, painless. They want to go on Amazon, make their payment. They want it as soon as possible. My kids are always asking why it can't be there today. It's just a mindset of it should be easier. And so that was starting to become the trend. Well, now with COVID kicking in, health and security has again overtaken convenience. The funny thing with it is now that we have that, men that mentality kicking in, we have folks that are worried about the way they're paying. They want to come in. They don't want to touch you. They don't want to touch your device. They don't even want to touch the door on the way out. And so when we offer them that contactless payment, we're actually moving to a system that allows them to be safe health-wise, makes them feel safer, it is more secure, and it offers a convenient way to pay. So now those cards have moved to the top of the wallet and people are starting to activate Apple Pay and Google Pay and other digital wallets within their phone system. That's right. So how do we take advantage of these things in this world and why should we? One of the ways that I could point out quite easily is to partner with a leading provider of both payment technology and software solutions. And with Embed and Global Payments Integrated, you easily have access to that. One of the big driving systems there is that right now, we were constantly moving towards non-cash, but with everyone now having a mobile device, we are constantly moving to these non-cash transactions to a point where we have to make sure that our hardware is capable, our systems are capable, our software accepts it, and we understand that people just won't, don't really want to touch that anymore. And so with those two systems provided, you can easily provide that seamlessly integrated, smooth user experience. Now, it's easy to add that, but we are in a constantly evolving, dynamic uh, state, and so we are always working to make sure that the newest technology is there and is available so that we can offer that. We've found that mentali mentalities are constantly shifting right. so that consumers will often choose where they shop based on what is available to them payment wise. We will soon reach a point where if you don't have a way to accept what a young person accepts as their wallet now, which is their phone, right. That's right. They will no longer be a consumer for you. So we have to make sure that we have that. That's right. One of the great things about a merchant running embed systems with global payments integrated is you now have one central location to collect all those payments. They can use embed sales POS, kiosk, embed bookings, 
and mobile wallet right. to let their consumer come in and have a truly amazing seamless experience, which draws them in again and again. I honestly cannot say enough good things about the mobile wallet. When Andy first told me about it, I was amazed at the effort he had put into this and what was being offered. It is truly one of a kind. And as a parent who gets really frustrated when we leave a family entertainment center with a card that still has cash on it, right. I know we're not going to find it again. And we often end up at family entertainment center that has movies. And as we're leaving, the kids will inevitably ask, dad, can we go and play arcades? I say, no, because our cards are at home. So it is, it's amazing to have a system that will actually store those game cards. If I have a provider that is using mobile wallet, I can store those game cards and go to the three different family entertainment centers that are the same, still have all of my cards available, ready to spend so that I can go in as a customer, your consumers can come in and they can play by tapping their phones or their enabled cards, which makes all the difference for these folks coming in and really it just comes down to the simple thing of making fun easy. Right. right. So with that there, I show you know, the hardware that's there. I can't overstate the importance of making sure that as we're moving forward, we really are moving forward. We update games, we update the batting cages. Hardware, software are super important in that. A credit card device can only take so, so much Right. Play from someone, especially in a family entertainment center where sometimes kids are playing with them. Those are things that need to be replaced. Your devices need to be replaced. Your hardware needs to be replaced. It is very important, not just for the fact that it makes it functional, but when someone comes in and thinks, oh, in this world, I should be able to tap it. When we're not offering that, we really are just shooting ourselves in the foot. Absolutely. We are taking away the opportunity to drive consumers through our door. Yes. So, yeah. You're absolutely correct, 100%. And if you're replacing your mobile device, for example, as a, as a personal consumer, if you're replacing it every year or every two years, um, if you're running a business and your livelihood depends on it, you really should um, stay on top of your hardware and making sure that you have the latest innovation because it's it's driven 100% by the consumer who's going to walk in expecting it um, to be ready. Do you absolutely correct? 100%. Absolutely. That's all I had. I appreciate you letting me. Uh... Of course. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you so very much. There's a few things that really stood out to me. Once again, I want to, I want to go back to that 2018, like 2018 was like yesterday. And the fact that your total contactless figure for the United States was 26 billion. Um, and that this year you're going to be landing at 178 billion with 40% of transactions being contactless. And the fact that the pandemic, um, it's, it's, it's readily understood, it's not debatable. The pandemic basically drove, um, it was a forcing function for people to look at what is the safest way to pay? What's the safest way to do everything basically? And payments, it just became very easy to do it um, via your mobile wallet. So even if you weren't doing it before, you are doing it now and you're doing it more pervasively um, for everything. And of course you have the protection of the mobile encryption technology, which also helps as well. Um, and then the other thing that kind of, um, kind of jumped out at me as well is is um, the fact that health and security are overtaking almost everything, including what someone might have perceived as convenience. And I just want to kind of elaborate on that for a second. Um, the fact that in the Middle East, many, many countries, when the pandemic, when COVID was declared a pandemic, many countries there said, we're not accepting cash anymore. Um, you're not allowed to use cash anymore simply because the virus transmits via cash. Um, so I think it's, it's really, um, it's just been a very kind of an unparalleled time. Um, and you notice I didn't use the term unprecedented. We're not using it anymore. <laughs> no. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, Andy, did you have any comments or anything about what um, Jeremy has just presented? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the, the sheer difference in those two figures and those two slides is, is staggering. And um, it was news to me that, uh, you know, for me, it was always about convenience. It's like convenience was the main aim of the, uh, of the, the entire platform. But learning that, you know, that's been gazumped completely by the concept of health and safety. Wow. Mind blown. Had no idea that that was so front of mind for a lot of people. Exactly. And if you're a business owner um, and you're looking at how to get, you know, that percentage um, share and percentage share of wallet, 
um, that 178 billion number is is not one that you can say, hey, we're going to turn our backs on that. No, for sure, know, absolutely. We're good right. with how we're doing right now. Yeah. No, instead you have to look at how do I like how do I continue to evolve and grow my business so that I can accommodate, um, especially the younger generations who use mobile for everything, right? Um, so anyway, really interesting. Doug, if you want to chime in, don't worry about it. You can chime in any old time. Uh, so that sounds good. I'm, I'm learning as well as everybody else. So, it, you know, to Jeremy's point, I mean, phone right here, right? So, I mean, once, you know, the health concerns and everything, when I go get gas or whatever, you know, I'm using my phone, I'm using my watch, whatever. So, I mean, um, you know, I can definitely relate, you know, outside of being an FEC owner and, and, and you know, how we integrated it. To me personally, how I, I've, been, you know, enhanced my contactless payments, you know, personally. Yes. Absolutely. And the research actually backs it up that a consumer will feel more confident in keeping their own mobile phone clean and safe uh, versus trusting that a high traffic surface area has been cleansed and it is safe. Right. Yeah. Um, and on that note, um, Andy is going to be presenting to us just kind of like helping us understand for anybody who's like new to just what what does the low touch economy mean? Yeah. He's actually going to be presenting some insights and in what it means. Um, to be low touch, or what that actually means, um, and as well as go into you know just some of the insights that are drivers for that, and then actually what your options are because there's so many options. And the best part of this is that the option is free. But I won't jump to the end of his uh, <laughs> to the end of his presentation. Go ahead and share, Andy. I know Absolutely. you're going to be starting with a riveting video. You may not hear it at the beginning, but you will. <laughs> in there. Thank you, Sarah. Introducing the Mobile Wallet, the next gen in cashless, fueled by Embed. Your virtual game card is added to the Mobile Wallet with no app download required. Fun is just a simple tap away. There are no apps to download and no more lost game cards, which means your virtual game card in the Mobile Wallet has the exact same functionality as a game card. Guests can do a quick reload of their game cards anytime, anywhere without leaving the game, which increases spend, drives return visits, and deepens customer loyalty. Tap, reload, profit. Guests can skip the kiosk and cashier lines, and there is no need for a balance check machine. You have total peace of mind with advanced security and encrypted tech with no risk to operators. Embed's mobile wallet is the only FEC business solution compliant and approved by Apple and Google. Welcome to the Low Touch Economy. Excellent, Andy. Take it away to the next slide. Okay, so the low touch economy, going contactless. Um, this talk's really about giving you a little bit of context, a little bit of understanding of you know, the, the very facets of going contactless. What does it even mean? What does it facilitate? And of course, drive to understand why it's important for you guys, right? And it's not just FECs, it's across the board. And I'd like to give you some insights into a, a variety of different uh, industries. Uh, a white paper uh, embed published months ago is really starting to reflect consumer consumption behavior. You know, particularly if we take a look at how they transact with business. And it's a big transformation that is happening now, right? Uh, let's not forget, 2020 isn't over yet. Uh, let's look at Melbourne, Australia. Uh, locked down almost 300 days. You know, coming out of that, curbside pickups and food delivery and mobile purchasing are just day-to-day -day habits. And I know that many there think twice about any location that is riskier than others when infections are concerned, right? Consumers are coming out of their long lockdowns with one thing in common. They've really changed. They're choosing to spend time and dollars at places perceived to be safe. Now, the thing that I'm really glad to report is we're seeing a lot of businesses respond amazingly. 
Um, they're creating safer environments to encourage trade. And studies show that businesses that are humming, but no evidence of social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera, et cetera, are more likely to be passed by, right? Uh, it's no brainer, right? When a business gets associated with a COVID cluster, the impact is indescribable. It's huge. So when we take a look at um, you know, Jeremy's slides, we're talking about uh, the dramatic story in a tectonic shift in consumer behavior, right? Contactless is big and permanent change to how consumers interact. The phrase low touch in, our, in the sense we're talking about is really about mitigating and even removing points of physical contact. I mean, even to the point where we're exchanging physical items like, you know, uh, an embed card. Um, in my view, one key thing though is the bit that doesn't get much attention is making sure that the touch points that do exist are incredibly well managed. You know, they're overseen, they are clean to a fault, and the, these are a really, really important part of the customer re-engaging and the customer experience. All these requirements of the low-touch um, business is generating a wave that presents huge opportunity for us, for FECs, that we can capitalize on by rejigging our business models, which is really what we want to uh, move forward with, right? Now, Pardon my French, I don't know what's Duraga across the Americas, right? Um, there are a lot of different things that I see regionally here in Asia with regards to how the workforce and the personal uh, elements uh, manage low contact economy. We've got, uh, you know, arrival temperature screening, uh, both at the office and even walking to a store, round the clock cleaning on the personal side. Um, it's no surprise that uh, the purchase of cleaning spaces, uh, cleaning um, sorry, the massive surge in purchase of cleaning products is really, really undeniable, right? In both cases, we're having altered social interactions. You know, people aren't allowed to be uh, in dense offices or in dense shopping areas anymore. And as a global study, there's definitely evidence that policy and government enforcement is having an effect on all these things, right? However, there's a lot to say that society by and large are making some key decisions. Policy in government isn't consistent place to place. However, these changes to the workforce and to the personal space are completely uniform. It's really, really quite bizarre. Now, across industries, I'm not going to go through every single one, but uh, here in Singapore, I don't know if it's made the news out there, we've got spot robot patrols. So we've got little robo dogs. I don't know if this, they're the same as the Boston Dynamics ones, but <laughs> we have little robot dogs that actually will go up to crowds and tell them to disperse. Um, I just went to a cinema yesterday and we had to have two seats in between us and, and other groups. Uh, there in Taiwan, there's an opera there which has three seats in between uh, different people just to make sure there's enough room to mitigate you know, the spread of the virus. In Europe, you can see we've got uh, the little screens uh, which actually prevent um, direct breathing on people. And in Belgium, this is my personal favorite, is you've got uh, distance proximity detector badges, which prevent people from being too close to each other for extended periods of time. I mean, nothing is untouched. We've got hair salons, getting married, the whole event business, everything has, has really been impacted by this tectonic shift. Now, again, um, when we actually take a look in the, in the FEC and the operations uh, priorities post COVID-19, there's a lot of similarities here, right? Front to back, We've got um, people remodeling our floors, and I'm sure many of us have faced these actually, um, remodeling their floors to make sure there's more space, uh, removing uh, games just to, to reduce the density a little bit to make sure that people are keeping well apart as they, as they play. Um, retraining your staff. I cannot understate how much time and effort that, that takes a lot of our customers, right? The amount of time in training staff in new ways of actually operating the business, and then ensuring that the operation of the business dovetails into those new practices right. has got to be an extreme amount of effort, right? Front of house, we're looking at, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, training your guests too. What are the protocols that allow you to actually gain entrance into a venue or, or a location? Um, you know, there's people uh, and FECs deploying new technology streams that allow people to manage fun without touch points, you know, pre-bookings, uh, the mobile wallet, obviously, you name it. It's, it's all happening. So the big deal, of course, is cash. The liability of dealing with cash, coins, tickets, and credit card pin pads, it, it cannot be overstated. Right. While COVID-19 research is ongoing, the virus is transmitted through direct contact with respiratory droplets of an infected person through coughing and sneezing and touching contaminated surfaces. 
Um, SARS only lasted two days, right? The old version of SARS. Right. Um, if you take a look at this, we've got four to five days on paper. We've got 48 hours on metals um, and plastic six to nine days, which obviously cover our FECs, right? right. So this thing is, it's, it's a big deal. It's completely different to what we've seen before. So with all that in mind, can we really say uh, we're ready to take this head on? Just to give a little bit more, uh, underline a little bit more of the changes, right? We've got 82% viewing contactless as a cleaner way to pay, right? Which mirrors what Jeremy's um, saying. Uh, we've got numbers in the, in the 70s talking about how, that they, uh, how consumers have changed to contactless payments and also will likely be remaining in uh, contactless payments. And it's not just idle talk, because if you take a look at contactless transactions over February and March, they doubled. Right. This, this isn't just idle uh, banter. This is legitimately happening. And what's really funny for me is it, it's going throughout the, the industry and it's going throughout um, businesses globally. Right. Disney is now the Animal Kingdom Lodge is now completely cashless. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Monopoly's also gone cashless as well. Right. I'm sure that wasn't entirely COVID related, but still, that's still a cool factor to, to wear away. Right. That's right. So, um, yeah, it's here. It's end to end and it's happening. So for you guys, the operator, customer attention is critical and it's driving guest loyalty is super important. Um, what we want to be able to make sure that you have the ability to do is to get in touch with your, your customers to ensure that they come back time and time again. And that, that's through our, our product stream. Everything from Embed Hygiene Defense, the mobile portal is all about driving that relationship with your customer to an, an amazing degree. Um, the mobile portal is a strong step to engage in, and there's no special software to download. You can focus on offers to drive repeat visits, which is really what you should be focusing on, right? Um, the operations of the business is handled by the wallet. Let uh, that do the hard yards while you guys focus on getting customers in and through. You know, the other bonuses can't be understated. We've got a post queue world. You know, there's no more queuing at the kiosk. There's no more um, waiting at point of sales. You know, it's service at the speed of thought which lets you just really maximize uh, people's time in there. And they're focusing on engaging with uh, the activities that you have rather than spending time in all these points of doubt where they're waiting in a point of sale and thinking, I've been here for five minutes, maybe I should consider another thing, right? Now, again, if you've got a competitor who's got the ability to, to make this happen, people are gonna be going there in their droves, right? So it's up to us to really drive that modernization piece. Right. Um, just in case, hey, Andy, just in case, just for any of our North American um, viewers, Q means standing in line. So no more standing oh in line. Oh, my word. Of course. Thank you. Q, sure. standing in line. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I should have subtitles. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're working very, very hard with AWS uh, all the time, constantly looking at how we lock down our environment to ensure the safety of your client's data, right? There's no more lost game cards. There's no risk to you. And as Sarah keeps stating, it's free. You know, it's, it's really a no-brainer. So I'd like now to take you through a little bit of a journey on how this actually comes together. So now with Embed, we operate on a number of different uh, levels. We, we were once very strong at the whole in-venue piece. We're now uh, pre-visit as well as visit in a very, very big way, right? What's central and what's key to me right now as, as a consumer is if I go somewhere, how do I even know I'm going to get in? What are those steps? What are those things that um, actually allow me to understand whether or not I'm going to have me, my full family at the front of your building with a very, very sad look on our face, right? So if you look at our bookings platform, we have the ability for you to manage availability, crowds in your system. So people can actually look in and say, oh, great, there's 50 places available, fantastic. I'll book in, I'll come along. When you actually click on um, and uh, appear at the, the front of the location, the mobile wallet kicks in and it allows staff to check in and check out. On the one hand, it's all about you know, just making sure that you've got your crowd numbers under control. On the other hand, it's also really, really important should something happen that you require contact tracing, right? The ability for you to respond to an emergency situation would be a game changer, I'm sure of it. Now, finally, of course, the mobile wallet, right? When they're in, engaged in the store, they're not uh, touching what they don't need to touch and they're able to just sit, sit down and just have a great time. That's what we're here to do and that's what the mobile wallet facilitates. So 
if I want to distill the importance of the mobile wallet, it's, it's a huge leap to understanding your clients on a different level, right? So they register with you and the data is available for you to dig deep into driving those relationships with them, getting them back to your store, you know, cross sell F and B, entertainment night, Halloween, for example, that's coming up. Uh, building that relationship with your clients is going to have a huge payoff down the road. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to making that bridge. Right. So on top of that, in building your customer uh, database, in going next level, all Embed's online gadgets will get you customers. What I'm looking forward to is when you guys start creating content for your customers about your brand reopening, about competitions, you know, the, the cut rate you've got on the sticky ribs for dad, wine offers for mom. They're going to be huge differentiators for you guys. And I'm really looking forward to collaborating with you. So, you know, I really hope this platform takes you to, to new levels with us. Um, thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Andy. And so just as, as you unshare, just to quickly summarize, so the COVID-19 Relief Act is um, Embed giving away the mobile wallet to the industry, and it doesn't have to be an Embed customer, it's just to the industry, um, simply because it's what the industry um, most needs now. And, um, and just to summarize some of the points that you had, there's no app to download, right? Yeah. Because we know that's always a barrier to entry. If you have an app, I mean, if you think about it, when you, the last time you downloaded an app, it really had to have a compelling value proposition. Yeah. Um, and so for me, sometimes that's like a, a non-starter. If I go to a, a business and they're like, oh, you know, we have a loyalty program, download the app. I'm like, nope, I don't have time for that. And so there's no app to download. They can register in shop and then they can reload anytime, anywhere from any yeah. game that they're at. Um, and so once again, what happens is they're there the, these consumers are then able to avoid these high traffic areas or standing in line. And, and it takes also that pressure off the, um, the operator as well, because they don't have to then be splitting people up to make sure that they're, you know, abiding by social distancing. And instead, um, people are able to basically enjoy everything that the FEC has to offer. And then in post visit, as you just mentioned a moment ago, um, anyone who has a mobile wallet, and this is, to me, this is really like the, 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 the gem, the gold, you will yeah. is the fact that you have this database of who your customers are that have the mobile wallet sitting in their mobile phone and you also are able to see where did they transact right what are they buying what are they using their game card for and being able to then offer promotions that drive return visits and then the more data that you collect the more you get to understand who they are what they like um, and what those winning propositions are. Um, and then you're able to step into loyalty programs, right? In which you're able to say, hey, I'm gonna offer rewards now for people, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's a very, very powerful, a powerful step towards future-proofing your business. Um, and while this concept, let's say, might be with the mobile wallet, I know this is the first mobile wallet that's offered um, to this industry. If you just look at other industries that have similar offerings, um, and look at the loyalty programs that have come off of that. I mean, look no further than the airline industry, oh, yeah. and the, right? And the different tiers of their loyalty program that they yeah. have, people tend to stay loyal. And so um, just really interesting all around um, the metrics that we heard from Jeremy and then how you've tied it together, um, Andy, with the mobile wallet offering and then just the data that goes with that. And now we're on to Doug. Hey. Hey, Doug. Yay. <laughs> Finally. Okay, so my Doug, turn. My turn. <laughs> that's right. It is your turn. But I want to, you know, properly introduce you first to everybody that, and I've already looked, and we have people here from um, Asia as well as the the Middle East. So I want to do a proper introduction of you, if I may. Sure. Um, absolutely. Of course. And so I am very, very proud to introduce. Um, Doug, specifically from Scary Strokes, and it's Scary Strokes is located in Waldorf, Maryland, and it is the passion project of husband and wife duo Doug and Lynetta Roth, and I'm very proud that obviously they are an embed customer, right, and they're using the mobile wallet. Now, the 11,000 square foot family entertainment center offers the ultimate entertainment experience. Attractions including 18 hole black light mini golf, a virtual reality Omni arena, arcade, prize redemption center, and a full service F&B at their graveyard grill. So you're seeing a common theme, right? Scary strokes, graveyard grill. So you can imagine that this Halloween season um, is gonna be an exciting time at this FEC.
Um, Scary Strokes fully embrace the necessity of a low touch economy by optimizing their current practices to ensure their guests felt safe. Scary Strokes is an exceptional model for navigating the pandemic successfully, staying engaged with their customers during lockdown. We're going to hear about that right now. Pivoting their business and implementing measures to deliver a safe, low touch experience upon reopening. Now, implementing Embed's mobile wallet not only enabled them to effectively offer their guests safe contactless gameplay um, and redemption options, but empowered guests to top up their virtual game cards anytime, anywhere without leaving the games. No more lost game cards. And best of all, the guest database Scary Strokes is building will enable them to drive return visits, future proofing their business. Doug, how are you today? I'm doing great, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Really, uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity for sure. Of course, and we appreciate having you having you as well. Now, when the pandemic, when COVID was declared a pandemic, um, and you had to go into lockdown, um, you were heading towards your three year anniversary, and business was booming. Now, tell me, what are some of the measures that you took during that lockdown before you reopened in June? What were like some of the measures you took to stay engaged with your customers, making sure that your brand was remained top of mind? And then what were some of the other measures that you took within your venue um, to make it safe? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, so before I get into all that, I do wanna say we, we did just celebrate our uh, three year anniversary on Monday, so. Congratulations, <laughs> bravo. Yes. Thank you very much. So we made the three years. So and, and hopefully for many, many more for sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, when when the uh, when the pandemic hit, and like you mentioned, I mean, our business was was thriving. Uh, you know, heading into our third year, you know, that's really the year for me. I think is really uh, tell telling uh, as far as you know what's what's your good months, what's your bad months, and we're like, okay, this is you know looking to be pretty promising. So. Um, when, you know, the wheels came off the train, um, you know, we knew that during the, uh, the downtime and the closure that we, we needed to do something. So when this did pass, whenever, however it does, uh, we would be prepared and, and, you know, welcoming our guests and our customers back into Scary Strokes. Um, so that being said, you know, we, we had a well thought out plan on, okay, well, what are the things that are going to be most important? And to us, uh, the first was no brainer. Right? It's going to be safety. Uh, we got to make sure that everybody is safe um, when they come and when they decide they come. And and we knew when we were given the green light that hey, there'll be some people that are ready, you know, they're chomping at the bit because at that time, you know, everybody's just wanting to get out of the house. They want to do right. things. Yes. We knew there'd be a, a a certain group that would kind of feel it out for a little bit and kind of see how the the people that were nipping at the you know the, the bit you know how they fared and then they'd make a decision and there's some that you know still to this day are you know they're cautiously you know still waiting it out until you know they feel that it that it's right whenever that that may be so we knew that you know we had to make sure that we we let everybody know whichever group they were in right. that when you walk into scary strokes you're going to be as safe as possible um so we implemented um, you know, we have hand sanitizer, just like everybody else, you know, implemented. Um, we had, you know, the, fortunately for us, our state was very big on and still is on, on masks and, and a requirement for wearing masks um, since day one. So, you know, once that was implemented, it hasn't wavered one bit. And so it's, it's been fairly easy for us to endorse that. Um, that you have to have a mask on when you come in the scary strokes, otherwise you just, you know, unfortunately you can't come in. Um, right. But fortunately we haven't had, you know, blowback on, on that, uh, you know, a whole lot. Wonderful. Yeah, it's been great. Um, you know, we have gloves. Um, so if people come in, of course, you know, we've had a very, very, even before COVID hit, um, I mentioned, you know, we just hit three years. Um, right. you know, our place looks immaculate. Um, today, just as it did three years ago. So, you know, our cleaning practices were already uh, above and beyond, you know, just standard cleaning, uh, cleanliness. Right. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, hey, if that's not good enough for you, here's some gloves. So we actually offer gloves if, if you know, they don't want to touch anything. Um, we offer masks if they, for whatever reason, don't have a mask or left it in the car or whatever, we have masks. 
Um, then of course, you know, the, 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 uh, the mobile wallet from embed, um, you know, it was just another tool that we figured, um, right. we could really implement in the scary strokes to help along that, that understanding that this is a very safe place That's you know, right. to come because once the green light's given, people are going to be like, Oh, you know, I, I want to go into an indoor facility with kids all around and, and everything else you know, as their first experience, right? They want some sort of confidence that, that they're going someplace, uh, you know, safe. safe. Yeah. So. That's right. Wow. Um, so Doug, you know, I've, I've just heard the hand sanitizer, the masks, um, and then other, I know that you already had a, a rigorous cleaning schedule. I think I wanted to ask you, did you do any rearranging of game rooms at all? Did you have to, did you, wow, that's a massive undertaking, isn't we it? Did. Yeah, we did. Um, we uh, we did a few things so so we had tables um set up in our arcade lobby area right outside the graveyard grill so when people purchased food and drinks it was right in there with that um, what we ended up doing was basically relocating uh, all those tables so we cleared all those tables out we took our party rooms because you know still to this day although i'm happy to report that parties are starting to pick back up for us Right. Um, you know, at that point, you know, there was really no need for those party rooms. So we basically spaced out tables six feet apart, you know, in these rooms, uh, just kind of like a, like a normal restaurant, if you will, um, and then cleared out the entire area. Um, and then doing that, then we were able to spread out some of the games. We got, uh, you know, if people were waiting to place a particular game, we got the stickers on the floor saying, you know, please wait here. Same thing with our redemption counter. We had, you know, a waiting area. You know, that way they're the next in line. Um, so it's it's worked out well. I mean, it's what that's one of the nice things about Scary Strokes um, in the design is, you know, it's there, there's not a, a choke point really. Um, you know, it's pretty wide open even in our arcade areas right. um, where you can, you know, uh, we don't call social distancing because that's what we do. We socialize, so we call it physical distancing. <laughs> yes, of course, and that's and that is. Um, very smart, much smarter. So I think if, if I recall as well, and, and having spoken with you, you also engaged people that were during lockdown, you engaged um, your customers via social media. Um, can, can you just share briefly just what some of the things that you that you did, especially for those who are still on lockdown that they might want to consider as well? Doing yeah, absolutely. So, so I, like I mentioned, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we stayed in, in touch with our customers uh, to let them know that when they were ready, you know, we were there for them. Um, and we wanted to make sure that although we weren't a priority for them, you know, we're ready for you when, when you're ready. So um, some of the things that we, we, we did was um, because at that time, of course, you know, nobody knew at all how long things were going to, you know, last. Um, for us, you know, it, it turned out to be pretty much three months exactly. We shut our doors on May 15th. We opened our doors on June 19th. Um, so for basically three solid months. So what we did um, the first thing that we did was we had basically uh, what we called a date night at Scary Strips. Yeah. So my wife and I, we went into the center, just her and I, of course, you know, everything was closed. Right. And we, we posted up on Facebook Live that, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to have this date night at Scary Strokes to where you can actually, we're going to play games and we pick people, you know, out of the chat just randomly. Yes. And I played for one person and, and Lynetta would play for the other person whoever won and we played random arcade games in our arcade and while one was playing the other was, was videotaping it and whoever won you know we would actually they would win you know future passes you know whether it was our triple plays or double plays or mini golf or whatever the case may be when we did open they could actually come and play those games and, and it was a big hit I mean we had music playing in the background and you know we, we tried to make it very lively I'm not a very animated person <laughs> really but uh but we had, a, we had a great time. It was a lot of fun for us, and it was a lot of fun from our customers. And absolutely. And it drove traffic on opening day. Right? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it, 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 was, it was so successful that we actually followed that up in September, or uh, I'm sorry, not September, in May. Yeah. Uh, May is National Mini Golf Day. It's the second Saturday of the month. Yeah. So we're, we basically did the same thing, but instead of this time playing the arcade games, her and I played mini golf and we played all 18 holes and we picked two random uh, people that were in our chat and we play, you know, two holes, you know, whatever, whoever went out of the two holes, that was the winner. And then, you know, we'd pick two more and, and, and so on and so forth. Yep. And then the final engagement that we did was right before we opened. So once we had our plan in place, once we had everything really laid out, 
we knew the date that you know we were going to be able to reopen. Yep. We went live one more time to basically you know show everybody exactly what we were doing. So we showed them you know here's the counter, here's the hand sanitizer, here's the gloves. We're ready you know for you guys. We can't wait to see you. Um, and then you know we we held our breath and, and, and crossed our fingers that uh, you know here here we go. That's genius. That's amazing. Absolutely right. That is so smart. It kept your brand top of mind. It was true engagement right? As opposed to just putting a post. Um, people right. won, they went on that journey with you. It was an element of sociability and then it drove traffic back when you reopened. And then just that, that um, showing them everything that you had done to mitigate risk um, also created that sense of confidence that, you know, that it was a safe, clean environment for them to take their families. And then plus you um, launched the mobile wallet. We know this, you were one of the first, in fact, to launch the mobile wallet. That was brilliant, Doug, way to jump on that. And then um, at the same time, I think you ran some of the creative because we have free creative that we're giving away to everybody who launches the mobile wallet to drive uptake. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe I saw some of your creative. You use that free uh, downloadable toolkit. Yeah, so we uh, we use the, the toolkit to really promote um, the mobile wallet. You know, it, mobile wallet for us was, was something, you know, we've always wanted to strive since the very beginning of Scary Strokes to, yeah. to not just be just another, you know, family entertainment center. We wanted to be on the cutting edge of whatever's out there. Right. And in this case, um, you know, e even if even if COVID never hit and 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 mobile wallet came out, I would I would pretty much say that Scary Strokes would still have been an early adopter of mobile wallet because of the technology itself. Um, as Jeremy and, and Andy were, were speaking earlier. To me, that's kind of the world that we're that we're moving towards, right? I, I, in addition to a phone, I also have an Apple Watch, right? I find myself using my watch to, you know, to pay, you know, to pay whatever I'm paying, you know, whether it's like I mentioned earlier, gas or you know, a convenience store or whatever. To me, it's the wave of the future, regardless of of, of any pandemics or anything like that. That's what we're going to. Um, so, so to me. You know, we really thought that adding mobile wallet and cutting technology to, to what we already had, um, you know, in, in addition to, you know, the whole safety feature with, hey, not having to, to deal with staff members or touching the kiosk or, or anything like that, it was something we really wanted to get onto. So we, we used the, the toolkit to really promote it. Um, so I created uh, website banners. Uh, I created QR codes inside our facility so people can, you know, if they want to download it. Uh, they can just, you know, uh, scan the QR code. That's right. Um, actually have a, a page on our website now. Actually, it's been there for, for a while now, but we have a mobile wallet web, web page. So right. people can go to the website. They can, you know, register their card and, and you know, they're off and, off and running. Yeah. I think one of the key things that, that Andy had mentioned that that's very important, I, I feel, and just, you know, I have it on my phone. I have my own personal card. So, so to give you an idea, I have I have a Scary Stroke staff card, I have my own physical player card, and then I have the mobile wallet on my phone. And me personally, I find myself actually using the mobile wallet on my phone more than my staff card and more on my player card because if I want to use one of those, I have to reach in my pocket, I have to get my wallet out, I have to flip through all the cards. I'm like, oh, here it is here. When I can just grab my phone, tap, and I'm off and playing. Absolutely. So so and that's just me. That's just I mean, and that's not like you know purposely wanting to use it or anything like that. It's just convenience wise, it just makes 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 sense. Absolutely. It's just there's just an ease there. So so tell us, um, I, I know that we're kind of running out of time here, but I, I want to ask you one really important question. Um, how are you doing from a, a revenue perspective year on year? Uh, we, we've been doing really, really well. Um, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we opened our doors back up in June, yep. um, the middle of June. So in July, uh, based on July of 2019, um, our revenue uh, was about 56% of what it was in, in June, or I'm excuse, uh, July of 2019. That's right. uh, in August, um, our revenue was 86% of what we saw. So that's actually still really good. Right. Um, yep. And then in September last month, we were actually at 103%. Um, and that's with without... Yeah. Pretty much, that's non-existence of pretty much birthday parties. I mean, that's pretty much all walk-in people, you know. And if 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 I may, just to kind of you know, kind of tie it in a bow, if you will. Um, this is as of 
um, actually uh, yesterday. Yep. This was a, a review that we got and it's very simple. Amazing staff, family friendly, very clean. And it goes on to talk about how we're a hidden gem in, in our local county here. Um, but, but to us, those are the main things. So the, that, is, that is kind of the basis of what Scary Strokes is. You know, it's right. it, it, the staff, you know, because people, we want to give them the greatest experience. You know, it's, it's cleanliness, you know, making sure it's extremely clean um, and, and it's fun, right? And that's, that's really what, uh, what Scary Strokes is all about. A absolutely. Safe, clean, fun. Um, Doug, it has been such a pleasure hearing this, and I want to congratulate you on um, being over 100% year on year and really kind of expediting that business recovery um, after the pandemic. And I think, and again, without birthday parties, right? When uh, yeah. we knew that a large That's percentage right. of your business is based on birthday mm -hmm. parties, and birthday parties are going to be coming back here shortly. And so at this point, I just, I can just see your, your business just continue back on that booming trajectory that you had before the pandemic. And so we, all of us here, um, congratulate you on being one of the first innovators to launch the mobile wallet and then coming here and then just, just sharing your experience with us. And obviously it's not just the mobile wallet, it's everything that you put into place and all of the efforts that you made to stay connected, to stay engaged. Um, and all of it is a beautiful example of the low touch economy. So I thank you so much, Doug. And I thank you, uh, thank you. as well for those statistics, which are mind blowing. So Jeremy, thank you very much. And thank Andy, you. of course, our gangster in chief. Thank you. Nerd in chief, so many titles. It's just it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. And to thank everybody you. who is at home, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we will later on um, be announcing when our next live webinar is. Send us any of the comments that you have regarding this. And gentlemen, have a great day. And Andy, have a great evening and a good afternoon to our friends in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, sir. See you guys. Thank you.